We, we looked at this slide last time and I thought it might be worth reviewing chemical and molecular bonds quickly. And, and some of the things that we talked about last time, interrupt me if there's any questions at all, uh, but some of the things we talked about last time without drawing the electrons in their shells around the outside of the nucleus of an atom, we talked at least uh, about why we would draw sodium with a, a little plus sign next to it. That indicates, uh, remember that sodium, as it came off of that periodic table of elements, was unstable. It wanted to, in this case, kick off an electron. And, and now that it has done so, we have to mark it with a positive charge. We said calcium uh, is, is roaming around with two positive charges because it's kicked off two electrons rather than just kicking off one electron. Uh, so there can be a gain or a loss of electrons. We said in addition to there being a loss of electrons, there were some elements in the periodic table that would tend to lose, a let's try that one more time, these have lost electrons, but there are other elements in the periodic table that tend to gain electrons, so if they gain extra electrons, we have to mark them with a negative charge. So we explained at least why there are these elements in the periodic table that are running around with positive or negative charges between them. We, we said this was a type of bond between a cation, a, a positive ion, and an anion, this, this negative ion. It was our example of an ionic bond. We'll go a little bit further. We talked about how if we're not gaining or losing electrons, that puts us in the category of covalent bonds where we have to share those electrons. And anytime we're sharing anything, like the example of stacks of $100 bills that I used last time, if we're equally sharing those electrons or equally sharing those stacks of $100 bills, did that, what kind of molecule did that lead to? Well, it's up on the screen, so kind of a re redundant question. You can see equal sharing of electrons is going to lead to molecules that are nonpolar. Whereas unequal sharing of those electrons polarizes molecules. The reason that was important is because when we get down, let me, let me maybe say that another way. The reason polar or nonpolar is important is because now when we zoom out, to another scale, we can see how this is going to relate to molecules forming either hydrogen bonds or hydrophobic interactions. Uh, which one of those molecules, polar or nonpolar, are going to form these hydrogen bonds? We've got hydrogen bonds forming between which of those, polar or nonpolar molecules? Here's an example. Remember this thing last time we mixed. We've got polar and nonpolar molecules that still, even after this crazy long weekend, they have refused to, to merge. So there's something holding these polar molecules together down here uh, and another interaction between these molecules that are holding nonpolar molecules together. What was holding? That's right. So hydrogen bonds are formed between polar molecules. So all of those nonpolar molecules are held together by these hydrophobic interactions. You know, if we draw that, I think we were drawing water molecules. This one that's on the screen as our main example of a polar molecule. So let's just, for a visual, draw some of these water molecules. In our simplified version of a water molecule, we were drawing it, or we will learn to draw it, kind of in a V shape where there is an oxygen at, sticking out at one end and then these bare protons sticking off of the other end of a water molecule. And, and that's what allowed me to put a little box around the, the molecule. It just makes it easy in my mind to, to look at each of these water molecules kind of like a bar magnet with a positive end and a negative end. Wherever the oxygen is, we mark it with a negative end. Wherever the hydrogens are, we mark that with a positive end. And, and like we're saying, if we have more than one of these polar molecules, let's draw a couple of water molecules. Uh, I'll put another water molecule over here. In its V shape, we can go ahead and put a box around them just to make it visually easy to see. 
Uh, we know anywhere there's an oxygen, that's the negative end of the molecule, and anywhere there are hydrogens, we've got a positive end of the molecule. So we've got three polar molecules now drawn and a hydrogen bond. This one right here is a bond that forms between polar molecules. So the negative end of one molecule and the positive end of another. Here's another hydrogen bond over here. After we've just said that and we've drawn it on the board, here's my review question. Um, why is the, what's, what's different between an ionic bond and these hydrogen bonds? There's a couple of things we can say. Like what, what, why is that not the same thing? I mean, it's true there are opposite charges that are attracted to one another. That's what they have in common. But what, what makes this an ionic bond versus this one a hydrogen bond? Yeah, throw it out there. Well, Okay, I like that one. That's the third thing. This is the third thing. So, so there's an unequal sharing of electrons where there's a total gain or a loss here. Okay, I like that. What are you thinking? Uh, the ionic bond is between atoms, but the molecular bond is between molecules. That's another big thing. So that's right. These, these are not molecules. Those are individual atoms. And, and down here, we've got entire molecules. So we've zoomed out to the level of molecules. That's, that's the second now that you brought up really the, the third thing, I'm thinking of three things now. So um, we're at the level of molecules here, where down here we're at the level of atoms. So, so the third and final thing, I'll, I'll just jump to this one. We said chemical bonds are going to make something new, whereas molecular bonds are not making anything new. Th these are still water molecules. Uh, they're just either held in close proximity by these hydrogen bonds, or if we heat them up and break the hydrogen bonds, they might fly further away. Regardless, they're still a water molecule. But up here, we're talking about individual atoms, and we said uh, chemical bonds make something new. So, so in, well, in the thing that I've already drawn on the board, we said that, that sodium all by itself is toxic. It's a reactant metal that would be very uh, dangerous to ingest on its own. Same thing with uh, chlorine gas. That would be toxic, and you wouldn't want to breathe that in all by itself, but if we combine both sodium and chloride in this chemical bond, we get something completely different, this table salt that you actually need for your neurons to function properly. So a real chemical reaction is going to create something new uh, that has totally different properties from its individual reactants. So we make something new with the chemical bond. Uh, we're, we're attaching atoms to make a molecule. And like you were pointing out, there, there's a total gain or a loss of electrons, where here, uh, those slight charges are due to unequal sharing. We're not making anything new. This is a, at a molecular level. Everybody good with that? Where we're going, I think the thing that we left off talking about was unique properties of water molecules. This is an example of another one of these hydrogen bonds that has formed between something that is not a water molecule and, and just kind of a review of what we've drawn on here again, hydrogen bonds can form between any two polar molecules. This is a pneumonia molecule, but it's not sharing electrons equally, so it's like a little bar magnet with a negative end and a positive end. And sure enough, if the opposing charges orient themselves together, then you can form these weak hydrogen bonds. Maybe the last thing that I'll say before we erase those chemical bonds is if we were to rank these chemical bonds in terms of how strong they are, the weakest of the bonds are going to be these molecular bonds. They're, again, they don't make anything new. They're just holding molecules in close proximity. Maybe, bless you. Maybe the one that we talk most about are these hydrogen bonds because they, they are what hold the two strands of DNA together. When we end up getting into unit three, we start talking about DNA. We spend most of our time talking about that molecule. I'm looking around the room because I wish I had a, uh, a model of that, that double helix. You, you know, I'm sure you've seen it. You can close your eyes and you can picture the, the ladder of DNA that is typically twisted. And, and if we untwist that DNA, if we uncoil it, it, it looks basically like a ladder. And, and either side of that ladder, let me just do it this way. Uh, here is the ladder that I'm referring to in the DNA molecule. Either side of this ladder, 
These are going to be held together by strong covalent bonds. So, so each side of this ladder is held together by really strong bonds, but we're going to see that, that I'll just make a little space in between the two halves. The steps of the ladder that you would step on are actually held together by these uh, relatively weak hydrogen bonds. So when we go to heat up a DNA molecule, the first bonds that are going to break are going to be these weak hydrogen bonds. So the whole thing is going to unzip into two single strands. If we wanted to still cause those covalent bonds to break apart, we would have to increase the heat to a boiling point, basically, to start breaking apart those covalent bonds. So hydrogen bonds are the weakest. They're going to be the first to unzip. So these were some of the first experiments done with the DNA, putting it in a test tube, heating it up, letting the two double strands unzip, and then recombining different types of DNA to see how many base pairs match up. Anyway, hydrogen bonds are weak. When we look at chemical bonds, we're going to, at least in our class, say that covalent bonds are going to be stronger than ionic bonds. If, if I didn't harp on this last time, if you take a chemistry class, they may tell you something different, that there are occasions where ionic bonds are going to be stronger than covalent bonds, but none of those occasions occur in an aqueous solution. In a biology class, we're talking about cells. We're talking about living organisms. And so, so the chemical reactions that take place in a cell are always in some type of aqueous solution, in some type of water. We will learn when we get through the properties of water, which is kind of where we're going next, one of the unique properties of water is that when you put a substance that is held together by ionic bonds in water, it will dis, uh, dissolve, disassociate from one another. So water has this unique property of breaking apart ionic bonds. You know, if we're talking about plastics or metals or something like that, then you might have ionic bonds that are going to be stronger than covalent bonds. But covalent bonds are not going to break apart in aqueous solution. So in biology, we consider covalent bonds stronger than ionic bonds. So now here we are, back to the slide that we left off with last time. And I was going to talk about these unique properties of water. I think we list at least four of these unique properties of water. Most of them are in your lecture notes. I think you even have a picture that looks something like this. In case I have to erase our arrangement of water molecules, we can see it's a collection of polar molecules. They're each like little magnets, and they can form these hydrogen bonds between one another. We still doing OK? All right. Remember, at the temperature, I don't know what the temperature is in here exactly, but at room temperature, really, any temperature is just a measure of how fast molecules are moving around. So as it heats up in here, that just means molecules are jiggling around a little bit faster. Uh, if we were to cool things off, these molecules would be moving a little bit more slowly. And that has something to do with how many of these hydrogen bonds uh, that can form. I believe we left off with these two pictures last time. Did we get to this two last time? I should ask. I was probably saying something here about the only difference between liquid water and ice, since it's just water molecules in both cases, there's no different substance. Uh, nothing but pure water molecules. The only difference would be the number of hydrogen bonds that are present. There it, I keep going the wrong way. There are fewer hydrogen bonds present in liquid water because it's constantly moving around at this temperature. So these hydrogen bonds are breaking and reforming. You'll have water molecules that end up closer together than they would in ice where there is the maximum number of hydrogen bonds. Uh, the increased number of hydrogen bonds we will see is going to equally space each water molecule out from the, the next water molecule. Let's see. So here's a sample of a bunch of water molecules. And I'm going to put the hydrogen bonds in. And you can see how those hydrogen bonds, they form that network that really holds the water together. If we're thinking of a glass of water, this would be throughout the entire sample. Next, let's give us some energy here. Let's take and put it right about room temperature and see what happens. So there they are. These are our water molecules, and they're all kind of holding together. If you look at any one water molecule, you'll see that the hydrogen bonds are breaking and forming, but they do stay kind of attached together. When we think about the properties of water, it's cohesive, there's surface tension, 
it has a higher boiling point than similar liquids that don't have hydrogen bonding. The hydrogen bonding has a lot to do with how water behaves. Let's heat this up and see what happens. Let's take it up to that 800 degrees again. There we go. And you can see that when we do that, at 800 degrees, water's gonna turn to steam. Those hydrogen bonds just aren't strong enough to hold it together, and it spreads out and forms a gas. So one interesting thing that happens because of hydrogen bonds, when we have water that is frozen, it takes a regular pattern. These are crystals, and a lot of that has to do with our hydrogen bonds here and how the water molecules are lining up so the positive and negative sides can be pointing at each other. So you see the hydrogen bonds here in our crystal of water. This would be moving a little bit as well. These molecules would be moving around some. A lot slower though because there's not as much energy there. A liquid water because there's some amount of temperature there. These molecules are constantly uh, moving fast enough to break and reform those hydrogen bonds. It's not yet hot enough for them to fly apart as steam. Uh, but you can see as we cool them down, eventually those maximum number of hydrogen bonds give you equal distance between the water molecules. That takes us into some of the unique properties of water. And, and it was even mentioned in this video that all of these unique properties of water all come down to the fact that each water molecule is like a little magnet. It's capable of snapping these hydrogen bonds. So if we're keeping track, let's, let's move into our properties of water. The first unique property of water is that it is less dense in its solid state than in its liquid state. That's typically not the case when we talk about matter, but water is less dense when it is a solid. It is more dense in its liquid state. And if you're asked to explain why that is, which you likely will, but you can't just say water is uh, more dense than, than ice. Why is ice less dense? Uh, well, the molecules are spaced, each water molecule is spaced further apart from one another in ice because the, there are more hydrogen bonds in ice than there are in water. And that, that lattice work of hydrogen bonds puts equal distance between those water molecules. Okay. The second thing that we're going to list in terms of a unique property of water is that water has a high specific heat. This is also somewhere in your lecture notes. This high specific heat, again, goes back to the fact that water molecules have these hydrogen bonds between them. And, and a high specific heat means that if I'm going to heat up water molecules, and again, heat is just a measure of how fast these water molecules are going to flip around, a certain amount of heat is first going to have to go into breaking apart these hydrogen bonds. Now, any additional heat is going to go into causing these water molecules to move around more quickly. Maybe the classic example of this is if I were to take, sometimes I like to get a piece of cake, chocolate cake, whatever, and I like to uh, put it in the microwave for just a couple of seconds, you know, just to get it a little bit warm. Does anybody do this? Some, some people just like the cake sitting out at room temperature. I like to put it in the, the, you know what I'm saying, just for a couple of seconds. But if you put it in there for longer than 10 seconds, that's too hot. The icing's probably going to melt over the side. You've got to watch it. But, um, but if I'm trying to heat up water or heat up my coffee after it cools off, I have to put it in the microwave for like 30 seconds or 60 seconds, a lot longer to get any kind of temperature change in water. Because, again, water has each of those hydrogen bonds between the adjacent water molecules, it's going to take much more energy to get these molecules to move around. We first have to, like we said, break hydrogen bonds between those water molecules. So high specific heat, a certain amount of that energy goes to first breaking hydrogen bonds and then causing those water molecules to move around. It's this uh, absorption of energy these hydrogen bonds basically absorbing energy that allows your body to use this evaporative cooling. By, by sweating and coating yourself in a thin layer of water molecules with sweat, now as that, that heat or sunlight continues to hit your body, some of that energy is going to breaking apart those hydrogen bonds and getting them to evaporate off the surface of your skin rather than to heating your, heating your arm up further. So evaporative cooling, if we think about other unique properties of water, it was mentioned in the video, if I, if I go backwards, there is surface tension that you see between water molecules. Again, I'm going back to the water molecules that I've drawn here. 
uh, water molecules each have these hydrogen bonds between them and if we are a very light insect like this water strider and, and just our body weight isn't strong enough to break those hydrogen bonds, then a, a lightweight insect can just walk directly across the surface of a water molecule. Maybe another way of thinking of this surface tension of, of water. We don't do this in here, uh, but it has been done in the past. Maybe you've done something like this, uh, where, where you take a penny, and then you just see how many drops of water you can put on that penny before the water falls over the side. If you're careful when you're doing that, you can see the, the cohesiveness of the water molecules. You know, they're each wanting to snap together. You can really get a big bubble of water on top of the penny before it falls over the side. So surface tension of water molecules is due to the fact that they each want to adhere to one another. And since we're thinking about water molecules forming these hydrogen bonds between one another, we might as well make a distinction between these two vocabulary terms. Adhesion is a water molecule forming a hydrogen bond with another polar molecule, something not a water molecule. Uh, if I go back to this picture here, this is an example of adhesion. We've got two polar molecules. Any two polar molecules can form a hydrogen bond between them. It doesn't make this any new molecule. This is still ammonia. That's still water. So not a true chemical bond. Uh, this would be adhesion. So two polar molecules that are forming this hydrogen bond. Uh, if, if we compare adhesion to cohesion, this would be a picture of cohesion. Cohesion would be hydrogen bonds that form between two water molecules. So back to this slide where we were looking at now examples of cohesion between water molecules. I, I, I used the example of surface tension trying to stack a bunch of droplets of water on top of a penny or the fact that each of these water droplets uh, being held by those hydrogen bonds if you're not strong enough to to physically break those hydrogen bonds then uh, like this water strider, you can walk directly across the surface of liquid water. And then finally, if we can think about how this comes into the second half of this class, in the 1407 class, we'll look more closely at plant tissues. And it's interesting to, to when we look at the tissues of a plant, we'll see that inside plant tissues, there are these long, continuous, straw-like tubes that are full of a chain of water molecules. And, and that's, it's really the case to think about these water molecules as linked together in a long chain. Each hydrogen bond is what links those chains together. And as one water molecule will evaporate off the surface of a leaf, it actually pulls that entire chain of water molecules one, one molecule over. This evaporation off a leaf surface is really what causes the pull of water into the roots. So again, putting my 1407 hat on for a second when we talk about this capillary action of water molecules, this just again draws on that cohesiveness of water molecules that they each are linked together like a chain and, and pulling on one water molecule helps pull up the rest of those water molecules through the plant. All right. If you're keeping track, let's go back. We've got uh, ice, or we can say water is less dense in its solid state. We said uh, water has a high specific heat, so we really have to invest a lot of energy if we're going to cause water to change temperature at all due to the, the large number of hydrogen bonds. Uh, we said water has these cohesive properties that allow them to act like a chain of water molecules moving through a plant or, or like a chain of water molecules that are an effective surface for insects to walk on top of. Next thing to list, so this would be at least the fourth thing that we've listed for unique properties of water. We're going to see water is a good solvent and this, this goes back to the fact that water can, can dissolve or break apart these ionic bonds. Let me use uh, just some just to get acquainted with vocabulary terms, um, when we're thinking about a solvent, you've got a solute uh, and a solvent. If we combine those two, it gives us a solution. Maybe one of my favorite solutions uh, would be something like sweet tea. I'm getting thirsty just thinking about it. But sweet tea, we can see it's a solution. It's a combination of two solutes. We've got uh, tea and we've got sugar. 
Uh, both of these would be the, the solutes, and then the solvent would be water. And we combine all of those together, we've got our solution of sweet tea. Water is an excellent solvent because what it's going to do, it's one of the things that it's capable of doing is disassociating ionic bonds. Salt, we, we know is a substance that's held together entirely by these ionic bonds. And look what happens when something that's held together by ionic bonds is uh, dropped into water. We can see the negative ends of the water molecules completely surround the positive ions. This, uh, these water molecules that surround the positive ion, this is referred to as a, a sphere of hydration. There is also a sphere of hydration that surrounds these negatively charged ions. Uh, and notice how it's the positive end of the water molecules that are attracted to the negative anion. The neg negative particle in this case. And, and the two, the positive ion and negative ion are separated by these two spheres of hydration. Uh, this is also something that is going to allow me to maybe give us some tips on what we're doing on Wednesday. We're going to do something like this on Wednesday. We're going to take an egg and when we put an egg into a beaker of pure water, the egg is going to sink to the bottom. But if we add some salt to that water and then stir the salt so that it dissolves like this in the water, we should be able to, to get that egg to float to the top by adding a certain amount of salt. Here's just where I saw this go wrong last semester. There were some groups that dumped a bunch of salt into the beaker but did not stir it sufficiently so that the, the salt dissolved into the water. If you do it like, if you put too much salt in there and don't allow the salt to dissolve, then you might end up having to put more salt than you really need. If you allow that salt time to dissolve, you'll find that you'll need to add less salt in order to get that egg to float. We had some random, like some numbers that were way off last year, and that's because people were just dumping salt in there very quickly to try and rush out of lab. Uh, but if you give it time, the salt will completely disassociate and you won't see any salt granules moving around in the bottom of the beaker. This goes not only with salt, but anything held together by ionic bonds. I'll try and stay color coordinated. We'll start maybe here at the top by just putting uh, the pH scale. Is that dark enough that you can see it in the back? Okay. The pH scale we can think of as a scale that really measures the amount of free hydrogen ions in a solution. Let me write that down. So pH scale measures Hydrogen, let me say it this way, sorry. We'll say measurement of hydrogen ion. I'll put a little circle around that so that we can recognize that as our hydrogen ion. So measurement of hydrogen ion concentration Maybe we'll just come down here and say, of a solution. So when we're thinking about a solution, this hydrogen ion, uh, let me say that again. When we are thinking about a solution, the pH scale is going to give us a measurement of how many of these free hydrogen ions there are. I'm, I'm even going to add that word in there. We're going to say... Let me grammatically correct that. <laughs> Measurement of, uh, we'll say, free hydrogen ions. Well, sometimes these hydrogen ions are going to be locked away in a molecule. Those don't count. They're no longer freely roaming around in the solution. We're just thinking of a measurement of these hydrogen ions that are roaming around free. All right, let's draw this scale out. It is a scale that goes from 0 to 14. And right in the middle, I'll eyeball it, we'll put 7. 7 is what we describe as a neutral pH. Completely neutral. 
Um, what does neutral mean uh, in, in terms of how many hydrogen ions there are free? Neutral means that for every one of these free hydrogen ions, there is an equal number of hydroxide ions. Th these are the two parts of a water molecule. To get back to our slides that we have, this slide shows us a beaker of pure water. And if it's pure water, if water molecules are the only molecules in there, then if a, this tends to happen with water molecules, they will spontaneously break apart. They will become ionized. If, if a water molecule were to break into two pieces, one part of that molecule would be a bare hydrogen ion. The other part of that water molecule would be what we call a hydroxide. Uh, if, if I haven't written this out before, anytime I write a little H with a plus, this is referring to a hydrogen ion. But this other thing that we're writing here in an OH, this is our hydroxide. So I'll refer to hydroxide ions or hydrogen ions. In, in a substance that is completely neutral in terms of pH, the number of free hydrogen ions should cancel out the number of hydroxide ions. And that's obvious. We've got four, looks like we had five water molecules visible in here. And you can see two of them have disassociated from one another. But for every hydrogen ion we have made, we have made also a hydroxide ion. So they cancel out as long as it's water molecules that are breaking apart from one another. But that changes when we start to talk about an acid or a base. Sorry, neutral pH of 7, the hydroxides and the hydrogen ions cancel each, each other out. But let's list some substances that are below this neutral range. And I'm going to get rid of our hydrogen and hydroxide ion setup just so I can write on the board. Anything that is on the low end of this pH scale is going to be what we refer to as an acid. Uh, and there are three things we need to know about an acid. Uh, we can see it's on the low end of the scale, so anything from 0 to 6 on this pH scale is going to be considered an acid. The things that we need to remember about an acid, the first thing, what we just wrote down, it has a low pH value. The stronger the acid, the lower the pH value. What that also tells us, in addition to a low pH value, all acids are going to have a very high concentration, that's my abbreviation for concentration, high concentration of those hydrogen ions. In fact, if you think of me as an acid, uh, it, if I had a bunch of hydrogen ions, like so many that they're falling out of my pocket, uh, I, I would very easily be able to donate or give these hydrogen ions away if I have such an abundance of them. That's the third thing we need to remember about an acid. They've got a high concentration of hydrogen ions, so it is common for them to donate, we'll say donate or uh, give up a hydrogen ion when they're put into solution. So acids kick off or, or give up these free hydrogen ions when put into a solution. The, the opposite of an acid is going to be what we describe as a base. There are also three things we need to know about a base, and they're the opposite of what we wrote down for an acid. Uh, we will start off by mentioning that a base is on the high end of the scale, anything from 8 to 14 on this pH scale. So first thing is that bases have a high pH value. The higher the value, the stronger the base. Bases have a very low concentration of hydrogen ions. They don't have very many of them, so they're not very uh, ready to give up any hydrogen ions. Instead, they're trying to absorb or pick up any hydrogen ions that are, that are close by. So the third thing we write about a base is that they, they tend to accept or pick up hydrogen ions.
So bases are going to pick up or accept these hydrogen ions in solution so they're not just roaming around. Um, these are the same things that we have on the next slide, so let's make sure that we have all of those down. Acids, they have uh, an abundance. They have a very high concentration of hydrogen ions, so it is likely for them to donate or release these hydrogen ions. Uh, having the high concentration of hydrogen ions is what puts them at the low end of this pH scale, telling us that they're an acid. Bases are on the opposite end of the scale, so they have a high pH value, anything above 7. Uh, they tend to accept or pick up these hydrogen ions because they have such a low concentration starting out. Um, it, you know, you, you might be thinking, we could say that bases have a high concentration of hydroxides, but the pH scale doesn't care about the concentration of hydroxides. It's really measuring the hydrogen ion concentration. So everything, all the words are about the concentration of the hydrogen ions. Either a high concentration of hydrogen ions for acids or a low concentration of hydrogen ions for bases. Here's a close-up picture of one of those acids. We can see that this beaker originally started out with just water molecules. And you can imagine uh, if just one of those water molecules were to disassociate, it would make equal numbers of hydrogen ions and hydroxide ions. But what we're dropping into the beaker in this case is the hydrochloric acid. This, when put into water, is also going to disassociate into a negatively charged chloride ion and then a positively charged hydrogen ion. Just a few drops of this hydrochloric acid has thrown off the balance between hydrogens and hydroxides. There's now more of these hydrogen ions. If you count them, there are one, two, three, there's the fourth one. We've got four hydrogen ions and only two of those hydroxides ions. So any acid is going to have a higher concentration of those hydrogen ions. An alkaline or a basic solution is going to have a low concentration of hydrogen ions. Like I said, if we count them up, um, there are only two of these free hydrogen ions compared to four of those hydroxides. When dropping a basic solution in here, you can see sodium hydroxide will disassociate into a sodium ion, and then the other half is the hydroxide. There are more hydroxides than there are hydrogens. So, so like I was saying, your brain might want to say bases have a high concentration of hydroxides. That is true but the pH scale doesn't care about that. It cares about hydrogen ion concentration. In this case, that would be low. So bases have that low concentration of hydrogen ions. If we compare substances on that pH scale, like I was just describing, uh, anything below 7 is going to be acidic. Anything above 7 is going to be alkaline or basic. W one example of something that we will talk about is, uh, I'll just put here, just above the pH of 7 is where we find blood pH. Blood pH has to stay within a relatively narrow range between 7.35 and 7.45. And anything outside of that range is going to be very problematic. There are proteins that float around in the bloodstream, and they, they, in order for them to stay in the same shape, they have to stay within a narrow range of pH. And if the pH of the blood gets out of whack, then these proteins lose their shape, and then they can't do functions like they normally would. Uh, and it can be very problematic. So there are some things that are set up to keep the pH of the blood within a very narrow range. Uh, I think it's next week. It could be the week after that. We're going to compare some unknown substances in terms of uh, how acidic or how basic they are. And obviously, the, the lower the number, the stronger the acid. The higher the number, the, the stronger the base. Okay. Uh, we said pH scale really is measuring the hydrogen ion concentration rather than the hydroxide uh, concentration. And just so that you can see I'm not pulling your leg. There's just two more slides to get through. In fact, this is the last slide, but I grabbed a couple of videos uh, that I wanted to use to kind of set up this slide because we've talked about acids and bases. The final thing we have to add to that uh, is to describe what a buffer is. Any questions about acids and bases so far? If I didn't stir anything up. 
Um, I'm grabbing a color that is between the blue and the red because down here at the bottom, let's talk about let's talk about a buffer. Sometimes a buffer is referred to as a buffer system. Uh, a buffer system might be more appropriate in terms of describing what a buffer is. Uh, just like an acid and just like a base, there are three things that we need to know about a buffer. Um, a buffer is two things. It is part acid. It's a weak acid. Uh, and it is part base. So part weak acid, part weak base. Since a buffer system is, is part acid and part base, it can do what an acid will do. So the second thing that we're going to list is that a buffer system can donate hydrogen ions into a solution. That's what the acid part of it will do. And the base part of it can act like a base and accept hydrogen ions. We'll just say in solution. That's my little shorthand abbreviation for solution. You'll come up with your own shorthand for taking notes. I'll share what my brain made up. Uh, so part acid, part base. Uh, buffer systems can both donate or accept hydrogen ions. And the third thing to add to that, since they can both donate and accept hydrogen ions, a buffer system, here's the main thing, it's going to resist any kind of shift in pH. resists shifts in pH. Let me go over here to give an example of that. And, and we've now gotten to buffers, and I know everybody in here has already completed quiz one at least once. Let's draw an example of one of those buffer systems. You have a buffer system in your bloodstream that keeps the blood within this narrow range of 7.35 and 7.45. The buffer system that you have looks something like this. The buffer system is part acid. This is the acid part. Uh, we're going to call this molecule carbonic acid. And, and like an acid will do, it, it has an abundance of hydrogen ions. It has two, not an, an overabundance, but it's got two. So it can kick off and donate a hydrogen ion if needed, like an acid will do. Uh, so this molecule we're going to see can spontaneously break apart into, uh, I'll, I'll put coming down this way, a bare hydrogen ion. And then the other part, if we rip a hydrogen ion away from that, what's left over is this molecule with a, a little negative sign because we've lost that bare proton. This molecule we called bicarbonate. And maybe this is just helpful for uh, that we're beginning our biology class. Anytime you see a word that ends in eight, like bicarbonate, it tells you that this molecule is going to behave as a base it's going to pick up hydrogen ions. So phosphate or sulfate or bicarbonate, these are all bases. And if it has acid in its name, well, then it's, it's going to be able to kick off one of these hydrogen ions. So let, let's put this hydrogen ion just moving out, uh, getting away from these two molecules, diffusing out into the bloodstream. Well, what we're left behind with, uh, again, is this carbonic acid and bicarbonate. These two molecules make up the buffer system in your bloodstream. Carbonic acid, we said, can, can go this direction and donate a hydrogen ion into solution if needed. Uh, but what if we're in a situation where there's too many of these hydrogen ions out here? So many, in fact, that they're moving in this direction. Uh, if we have too many of these hydrogen ions, well, then, then bicarbonate can act as a base and it can draw this correctly. Uh, bicarbonate can act as a base. It can pick up one of those free hydrogen ions and bottle it up into this molecule. 
So if that hydrogen ion is locked into a molecule, it's no longer free. We've removed it from floating around in the solution. So a buffer system can both donate a hydrogen ion or pick up a hydrogen ion and lock it away uh, if needed. M maybe one thing I want to add to this since we're talking about a biology class. Um, Let's see where this comes from in the first place. Th this carbonic acid, it's actually the same molecule that's causing our oceans to be too acidic as well. If you've heard that the, a lot of marine life is dying off, like the coral reefs and things like that, because the oceans are becoming more acidic. Uh, one of the reasons the oceans are becoming more acidic, that, that is telling us that there are too many of these free hydrogen ions in ocean water. Where are all these free hydrogen ions coming from that's, that's causing the ocean water to be too acidic? Well, if we, if we go back to these two molecules, we're going to see that carbonic acid is, is kind of an unstable molecule. It will spontaneously break apart, like we said, into bicarbonate and this hydrogen ion. Where most of this molecule comes from, it's a natural chemical reaction that happens whenever water molecules are combined with carbon dioxide. You have water molecules in your bloodstream, and if you just hold your breath and refuse to exhale, right, if I'm doing this and I'm holding my breath, then, then the amount of CO2 is just steadily building up in my bloodstream. And in order to, to decrease the CO2, I need to exhale. So if you refuse to exhale, or if you're, like sometimes you want to increase the amount of carbon dioxide in your bloodstream. That's why people breathe into a paper bag and then inhale their, they re-inhale what they have just exhaled. You're breathing in the carbon dioxide that you've just exhaled. Uh, what you're doing there, the, the amount of carbon dioxide in your bloodstream is going to mix with the free amount of water and end up creating these carbonic acid molecules. Maybe the, the way to simplify this is there's a direct relationship between how many of these free hydrogen ions we have out in the bloodstream or out in the oceans. How many free hydrogen ions we have is directly related to how much carbon dioxide is in the bloodstream or how much carbon dioxide is in the atmosphere because that carbon dioxide mixes with the water in the oceans and we end up with more of this carbonic acid that's constantly spitting off these free hydrogen ions. Anyway. Uh, your body has two other organ systems, like the urinary system that can just urinate out these hydrogen ions, and your body also has the respiratory system that can regulate how much CO2 is present. If, if there's too many of these hydrogen ions in the bloodstream, your body will spontaneously go into one of these <sighs> uncontrolled hyperventilation. If you've seen somebody go into these uncontrolled <sighs> hyperventilations, it happens in people that are extremely diabetic, whose bloodstream is already too acidic. And the only way that their body can compensate to try and get rid of this excess hydrogen ion is by getting rid of a buildup of carbon dioxide, <sighs> blowing off excess CO2. Um, I also saw this happen the other way, where we used to do a lab that required people to draw their own blood. We obviously don't do that anymore for obvious reasons. But uh, there was a, a lady that was very good at drawing other people's blood, but she did never, she'd never tried to draw her own blood before, and uh, it caused a panic attack. So she was quietly sitting uh, on the side and didn't ever let anybody know, you know, she was having this buildup of stress, and, and it led to this full-blown, you know, maybe I actually saw this happen with a test. These tests in here, hopefully we will be prepared enough that none of these tests are very stressful. But there was one time that a student was about to take an exam and they were so stressed out that they uncontrollably <sighs> just kind of did this panic attack thing. And if you're, if you're exhaling more than you normally would, then you're going you're gonna to end up with a deficit of CO2. You're blowing off CO2. And then you would end up with too few of these hydrogen ions in the bloodstream. And that's bad as well. We need a certain amount of hydrogen ions in the bloodstream too few uh, or too many are going to cause us to get outside of that narrow range of tolerable blood pH. So the whole point, buffers are going to help resist these wild shifts in pH. That's what this graph is trying to show, that, that if we continually add drops of hydrochloric acid, 
that uh, in a buffered solution, what a buffer is going to do is it's going to help resist any kind of wild shift in pH. And looking at the list of slides, that takes us all the way through chapter two. So I feel like we've gotten uh, really ahead in our lecture like we wanted to.